so now fluid dynamics. So here you can see a picture of um, the incoming nuclei. And depending on what you guys are doing, there are several details of this which could become important. Um, you don't have, the nuclei take up some finite amount of space. And what you see here, the Z axis in pretty much all colliders is lined up with the beams. So the incoming beams are here. And then um, at both Rick and the LHC and all the experiments that I've been on, this is the standard coordinate system. Um, the X uh, axis is parallel to the ground and the Y axis is perpendicular to the ground. And you have in general, an asymmetric overlap between the two different nuclei. You have one very important clearly defined plane, and that is the reaction plane, which you guys put, may have read about. It's in, it makes a brief appearance in both Griffith's um, E&M and Griffith's um, quantum mechanics, and it also shows up in the mechanics textbook that I uh, thought out of, but you wouldn't necessarily notice if, if you weren't paying attention. So you draw a vector between the centers of the two nuclei, and then you draw the line along the beam pipe. And the plane that um, contains that vector in that line is called the reaction plane. We don't actually measure that in practice because of a lot of very important details. But what you will see in general is the along, so in the plane perpendicular to that, so this is looking in the XY plane, you have an asymmetric overlap region. So here you can see the outlines of the incoming nuclei. And to a good approximation, so here you have the equipotential surfaces. In general, the equipotential surfaces are, to a reasonable approximation, parallel to the surface of that overlap. And that means that you have a pressure gradient, and the pressure is larger in, um, in plane, so along the short edge, than it is out of plane, so perpendicular to that. And if you have a fluid that has a high viscosity, as it expands and it cools, the, the system becomes more and more spherical. If you have a system that has a very low viscosity, there's not as many interactions between the particles as it's expanding and cooling. So um, this asymmetry and this spatial asymmetry is going to be converted into a momentum asymmetry in the final state. And we quantify that. We usually are lazy and call it a Fourier comp decomposition. For some technical details, it's not actually a Fourier decomposition, but that's it's close enough. And if you do a Fourier decomposition, you're basically just expanding the asymmetry in terms of a bunch of coefficients. Um, and then, yeah. So these coefficients are what we measure. And you'll, so you'll hear people talking about V1, V2, V3. Um, and they're really talking about quantifying the asymmetry in the final state particles. Um, and th that same asymmetry is actually how you can try to measure this reaction plane because you have more momentum in this direction along the reaction plane than you have in the other direction. So here is this video. Um, this is actually from gases, um, but it, you can't videotape a quark gluon plasma. So here you see the high viscosity one. I'm going to flip slides so it restarts. The high viscosity one, as the system expands and cools, it becomes pretty close to spherical by the time the system dissipates. Whereas the low viscosity one, um, the eccentricity, the, the, it was short in this direction. It is now short in the other direction. And <clears throat> So these, 
these initial state anisotropies are converted to final state anisotropies. You can draw cute little pictures. This is, this is really nothing more than what you guys could do with a graphing calculator. And you're just quantifying um, that anisotropy, except this is now not a spatial anisotropy, but in the distribution of momentum. So the first one is offset. This we've measured. Um, you hear a lot about V2. This is also called, um, so the first one's directed flow. You, you hear the whole thing called collective flow. Um, because you have a pressure gradient, um, the, in, to a good approximation, the particles are experiencing the same force, but they have different masses. So what you see is that this um, anisotropy, this V2 in this case, is greater for larger particles and it is, sm it is smaller for heavier particles. Um, so here you can see this ordering. So protons are heavier than pions and kaons are in between. So you see that, um, that V2 is smaller for protons and as mass decreases, V2 increases. And um, the lower, uh, that should actually say higher viscosity. Higher viscosity would move the V2 down. Lower viscosity would move the, the V2 up. So the fact that we see V2 at all already means that we have a very low viscosity. Um, and you can compare this to a hydrodynamical model. So the model is complicated. They're actually doing relativistic hydrodynamics um, and trying to calculate um, what V2 you would expect. And I would have to look up the model to remember exactly which version this is. But the big picture is that you see that the model sits pretty much right on top of the data. It's really good agreement. So um, we conclude that yes, this is this picture is consistent with the data, um, and that what this means is that the quark gluon plasma then has an extremely low viscosity, um, and you can look at a lot of data on mass ordering. Um, the the details, the picture falls apart if you poke at it too much, um, but this is an introduction. Um, so you can look at something, you can scale the this VN by the number of quarks, and on the x-axis you can scale it, the, um, this is a measure, of, this is transverse mass, um, but this is, so there's a measure of the momentum, divided by the number of quarks. And what you see is that when you scale by the number of quarks, they pretty much fall along the same line. And from this, we concluded that we actually have a liquid of quarks and gluons, not of hadrons. So that was not a given because we knew that we were going through this hadronic gas phase. Now, the details, there are deviations from this now that we have much more precise data. And those deviations are important, but they don't change the big picture that we're pretty certain now that we have a liquid of quarks and gluons. And I think that what can get lost is that back in the old days when I was a beginning graduate student, um, we actually thought we might have a gas of quarks and gluons, not a liquid. So we were, were a little surprised when um, we found that we had a liquid. It was kind of cool. Um, so what do we learn? We learn that the that this relativistic hydrodynamics actually works. So we can talk about the quark gluon plasma as a liquid of quarks and gluons. We have at least approximately um, a, approximately um, localized thermalization. So you get it's not crazy to talk about equilibrium. With let me put an asterisk by there. So. There's a lot of important details. Um, you can actually get a lot of constraints on what the incoming nuclei look like from this. There was a conjecture for a lower bound on the entropy to the viscosity to entropy density. And our best guess is that we are above but very close to that bound. 
Um, so this led to a declaration that the quark gluon plasma is the perfect liquid. And if you attended the right Rick AGS users meeting, you got a mug. I still have it upstairs. I'm not giving it away. It's very precious. So um, the QGP is the perfect liquid, and it is free quarks and gluons, which is not what we expect. This is a good spot to pause and ask for questions. Or a soliloquy from Ron on other details on this. Um, so I thought that was great. Um, the only thing I might add is that, you know, you, you put an asterisk by the local thermalization. And of course, this has gotten extremely controversial over the last couple of years. So it's probably, you know, it may or may not be kind of beyond the scope um, for, for undergraduates, but this is the kind of thing that people really like to go to conferences and argue about, um, you know. At, at this point, I think most people believe that thermalization isn't achieved. And the question is, you know, can you get away with applying hydrodynamics even, you know, outside of equilibrium? Some people think, oh yeah, that's totally fine. Other people are a little nervous about it. But um, it, it's actually really hard to calculate from first principles what the thermalization time should be. Um, but it has been attempted and it's like, you know, seven, five to seven Fermi over C, which is basically about as long as the whole QGP lasts. So it seems to never actually get there. Um, the question is, okay, fine. So we, we more or less all agree it never actually gets there, but is that, is it close enough that hydrodynamics still applies? And I mean, it certainly does an extremely good job of, of describing the data. So that, that, that in a sense is sort of an argument in its favor, but you know, um, Plenty of theorists seem to think that, yeah, it applies even very far from equilibrium up. There's this person named Paul Romachka who has done, you know, a, a lot of work on this. Um, Paul's advisor, um, Mike Strickland, has also done a lot of work on this. So, you know, there, there, there's a bunch of people who have really kind of seriously thought about it. And yeah, it, 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 it probably doesn't actually thermalize, but you can still, uh, hydro is still valid and applicable. Uh, and Ron, maybe I can jump in on this if you don't mind, Christine. Yeah, yeah that, I think that'd be great, George. Please. Uh, yeah. So you know, hydrodynamics doesn't doesn't require thermalization at all, like the the theory of hydrodynamics. What you need is you need a constraint for the variables that hydrodynamics doesn't have constraints for. So this is where like the lattice the lattice calculations that connect entropy density to temperature come in. Now hydrodynamics needs that input in order for it to function. All of those calculations assume local equal equilibration. That's why people say hydro needs local equilibration. Otherwise, hydrodynamics is just conservation of energy and conservation of momentum, and things will move inside from fluid cells as long as you have those properties. But it's the connection to how does temperature connect to energy density or how does temperature connect to entropy density. All of the theories that we have of that come from local equilibration. That's the problem. If you want to use hydrodynamics to measure observables and you've used those conditions, you're making those assumptions. So if you want to say that hydro predicts equilibration because it gets the data, that's when you should start arguing, right? So, so there's a question here. How can we determine the fluid properties of this object from a particle standpoint if the mean free path is less than the size of the internal particles. Can we describe the internals of the system in terms of a gradient function exactly or only strictly as a potential for function from the predicted initial and final states? Since this is phenomenologically a fluid but has characteristics of, like those of a large nucleus, is it safe to say that the fluid is described only in aggregate or can we define flow for a constituent. Lastly, what would an ideal equation for moment, the momentum vector field look like for an individual particle in a fluid? I'm going to kick this maybe to George. So that was, that was a lot to read. So I'm still sort of rereading it. So maybe I'll reread it as I, as I answer. So how can we determine the fluid properties of this object from a particle standpoint the mean free path is less than the size of the internal particles. Okay, so the first thing there is that uh, at this point we should stop thinking of particles as having size. These are now 
quantum mechanical objects. And uh, if you if you know if you know if you've heard about the de Broglie wavelength already, but you can think of uh, there's a relationship between what you would call the wavelength of the particle and its momentum. So the smaller smaller momentum particles have a larger wavelength. So the the size isn't really a thing anymore. So it's hard to talk about things as being points in a grid. So what what we do instead with hydrodynamics is you talk about energy density. So you put the energy density in there, and that energy density is a is a function of now whatever size of the grid you use to map out your your calculation. And that size of the grid actually does matter a lot. Uh, so and people you know people spend a lot of time just working on that. But so think of it now as a, a di distribution of energy density. Uh, so can we describe the internals of the system in terms of a gradient or exactly how strictly as a potential function is predicted in the final states? Okay, so if we're talking about hydrodynamics again, then there's essentially three scales to the problem. So think of it like there's the size of the whole collision that sets one scale, right? And then there's the size of the mean free path, which is in, you know, the estimate between where particle interactions, if you think of this as a gas instead of a, uh, a liquid, then you maybe you think about the particles are moving around in that liquid. So there's the, the size of the interaction size between two particles in the fluid. That's a second scale. And then there's a third scale, which is exactly what you said, which is the, uh, which is the gradient. So that's like, so when Christine was talking about these differences in pressure, in the, in the collision that pushes one direction faster than in the other direction. A simple way of thinking about that is thinking about how when the particles are deposited, what's the density of the distribution of those particles? So where that density is higher and goes to a, goes, if you go out from the center to the outside, the density starts out high and goes low. That's the gradient we're talking about and the, the pressure to push outward is proportional to that gradient. So the steeper that gradient is, the bigger the push you're gonna get. So that's the, that's the third scale. So those three scales determine how all of hydrodynamics works and things like viscosity are based on those three scales. So particularly the size of the gradient. So that, that gradient is exactly the thing that we're talking about. And so that's how you measure the fluid properties because you can measure those gradients based on the particle distributions that come out after, right? If those particle distributions are not symmetric, that means there must have been some sort of gradients. If you can use those, those gradients to go backwards to your model and try to get an estimate of what the viscosity is. Uh, okay, so the next one is since the phenomenologically a fluid it's a fluid but has characteristics like those of large nucleus. It's safe to say that the fluid is described as only an aggregate or can we define flow for a constituent? That's, that's tricky. So there are, different, there are different models of hydrodynamics. So there are, there are ones that try to follow flows of constituents, but then that's still a little bit like what you're still doing is depositing energy density and you pick uh, a fluid cell that has a certain energy density and the different ways of constructing hydrodynamics is you can let that cell move and follow it around or you have a fixed grid and you just follow the energy density of each point in each fixed grid. And, that, and so again, both, both of those, you're just trying to find things like the gradients in order to calculate things that depend on the gradients like viscosity. Uh, so lastly, what would an ideal equation for a momentum vector field look like for an individual particle in the fluid? That is also tricky. So if you want to do that, then you're talking about kinetic theory and not necessarily hydrodynamics anymore. This is also a valid, a valid way of doing it, where in kinetic theory, you assume that all the particles are particles and are colliding like particles in a gas. Uh, and this can have fluid-like behaviors, uh, but I'm not sure about an ideal equation, ideal equation for momentum vector. Most likely this equation would be what's known as the Boltzmann equation. And uh, that's maybe a bit 
more complicated than this the level for this talk, but you could probably Google that to see what it is if you want to know more. But that's usually when people try to do individual particles and interactions of individual particles usually end up using the Boltzmann equation. Uh, so they're not outside the realm of the talk, but uh, the more into the weeds we get, the more uh, technical the answers get. So I apologize if the answers are a bit technical. Yeah, so I also think that if you guys are not following the details of that, it's fine. Most of you guys will be working on a small piece and I don't think that this this will get you all the details. The goal is that it gets you started so that then when your advisor asks you to read something, you're not totally overwhelmed. 